<clears throat> These two chapters uh, kick off the part of the book about object-oriented programming. Um, starts off with a quick discussion of base types off of which um, object-oriented systems are based. Uh, and then goes into the S3 object-oriented system, R's oldest OO system. Um, this is all sort of new stuff to me, so I tried to hit the highlights. And, um, you know, I think they're there for the most part, but if anybody wants to jump in with any clarifications or questions, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, quick introduction to object-oriented programming. We've heard all along that everything in R is an object, and I didn't realize this, but that doesn't mean everything is object-oriented. So we'll try to wrap our heads around what, um, what it means for something to be object-oriented. These are the three main object-oriented programming systems in R, S3, S4, and R6. We'll be talking about S3 today. Uh, there are others, but um, Hadley thinks they're more obscure and that these are the most important ones. Um, OOP systems display polymorphism, which means that uh, a function's interface is separated from its implementation, and uh, this allows the interface to be extended with implementations for new types of input. Um, and in an OOP system, uh, objects have class. That's, um, that's a special attribute um, added, on to, added on to any object. Um, and then those classes uh, have an associated method. That's the, uh, the implementation of a, of a function um, specifically for that class. Um, Method dispatch is the process of finding the correct method given a class. Um, chapter 12 was real quick. It's about base types um, and comes with this useful diagram. Um, basically, since everything is an object, but not everything is an OO object, uh, we can differentiate between base objects and OO objects, uh, the difference being um, every object has a base type, but OO objects have at least a class attribute. Uh, chapter 12 then goes on to list the 25 different base types available in R, um, but I won't rattle those off for you here. Um, moving right along to S3, uh, S3 is uh, R's oldest object-oriented programming system. And apparently, I, and I don't quite understand this, but um, you know, it's very minimal and very flexible, uh, meaning you can't take away any part of S3 and still have a useful OO system. Um, and also S3 has few built-in constraints and you have to, uh, so you have to apply those yourself. We'll see. Um, possible ways you can shoot yourself in the foot with this flexibility and ways to, uh, to enforce uh, object-oriented or your, your, uh, what your expectations for the object-oriented system. So object-oriented objects all have a class but S3 has no formal definition of a class. Instead, you, uh, you set its class attribute, and then you give it this, um, this array of functions that, uh, that will help um, you know, ensure that there's some structure to your, to your objects. Uh, these functions include a low-level constructor. That's the one that declares the, uh, the class attribute, uh, a validator that will um, that will check to make sure you're giving uh, the correct inputs uh, to your to your class object, and a um, and a user friendly outward facing helper that has plenty of um, 
you know, helpful warnings and error messages uh, and more strictly enforces um, the, uh, the structure of your, of your classes. Here's a simple example of a constructor. All it does is it uh, turns your object into a date. So what does it, what does it do exactly? Um, basically, it's a function that defaults to a, a null a vector of type double. Um, tells you not to go through with it if it is not double, and then assigns class date to your object. So here we see it works, new date, negative uh, one, zero, one gives the dates associated with those integers. Um, ah, here's, a, here's another example of a constructor that's a bit more involved. Um, diff time, like date, is a, uh, is a double, but it also has a units attribute. And we want those units to only be seconds, minutes, hours, et cetera. So here we set both the class diff time and the units as, uh, as, as one of those. Uh, here we see new diff time, 110, 3600 in seconds, and tells you time difference in seconds. Oh. And then there's another example, but I let it uh, run off the page. Sorry. My uh, markdown skills um, are, are being tested this week. Looks like something I need to brush up on. Um, we talked about the, the constructor just sort of tells, uh, you know, assigns, uh, assigns a class to your object. The validator uh, ensures that your your object has the correct um, structure for its class. So, say we want to make um, factors. Uh, we'll take x a vector and a character vector of levels. Um, if the if um, <clears throat> If x is not an integer, we stop. If the levels aren't characters, we stop. And then we assign both uh, the levels attribute and the class attribute of factor. Um, these guys would give an error because uh, I think because there's like not enough levels. We'll, we'll see more of that shortly. Um, Oops, I'm sorry. This is a constructor for a, for a factor. Now we move on to the validator that has more fancy stuff going on. Um, so this takes the, uh, the, the object that we want to be a factor, um, make sure it has levels, and then it checks that those levels are not, uh, checks that those levels are there. Um, and then it checks that uh, there are enough levels for um, for the values uh, that appear in your in your object. Um, now we could validate our new factors uh, one that gave us errors earlier, and they'll give us these helpful uh, errors in the body of the code. Um, if you, so if you, if you want to create new classes, all you have to do is create a constructor. If you want to enforce more structure on them, um, and ensure everything's working the way it should, you create a validator. And now if you want users to, uh, create their own classes, you should create a helper function that, um, you know, gives them, uh, gives them some constraints on, on their inputs, uh, that gives good, good messages if something's, something's awry, and, um, and that generally has some sort of standardization and convention that, that your users can follow. So
So let's see. This is a constructor um, for for diff time. I think we already saw this. Yep. Great. If we do diff time one through ten, it gives us difference in seconds, which is the uh, default units, and then factor. Uh, ah, this. Ah, this is a helper function that has both the validator and the constructor in it, um, so that your users can just call factor and it uh, and, and it um, does does all this stuff automatically after after checking um, that. Your X has has levels and um, you know all all the good stuff that needs to be a factor. Chris, I just have a question. Uh, yeah, you go back to that last slide. Of right. course. What are the what are these uh, outer functions called? So like I know you said there's uh, you have the validate the validator the constructor. What is the outer function called? Like the you know, uh, the first one. Or just yeah, like like the general name for the function that contains the validator and the constructor. This is the helper function. Oh, the helper. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, um, you have a constructor, a validator, and a helper. Um, from from most basic to higher level, and uh, so this is the helper containing the validator, and the constructor. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for the question. OK, so once we have all these classes, um, you know, why did we go to all this trouble? Well, um, you can have functions that are called generics. And what they have is different behavior based on the class. That behavior, as we saw earlier, is called method. Um, and generic functions uh, perform method dispatch. That is, they take the class of the input and then decide uh, which, uh, then they decide what behavior uh, the generic function should have based on that class. Method dispatch is performed by use method, and use method uses deep magic to pass to the method automatically. Um, so here's where I start to lose the thread. Uh, I'll I'll forge ahead here, but um, I kind of thought, okay, I get generics and methods and all the other stuff, and then kind of lost me on use method. So let's see, did I just? Yep, I just went ahead and glossed over that. So sorry. If there's if anyone wants to get deeper into use method, I'm um, I welcome it, but. Uh, I'm not sure I'll be a helpful uh, authority on that on that subject. Um, objects have different styles. We've seen the vector style uh, object classes like date and factor. Um, another style is record style, uh, like like the POSIX objects, which are actually um, a list when you look at them. Uh, Data frames similarly are a list, but they're conceptually two-dimensional. Um, and then there are scalar objects, which uh, use a list to represent one thing, like LM, a linear model, um, is a list of length 12, but represents one model. Um, objects can have more than one class, and so if uh, if use method, I think, doesn't find a method for one of those classes, it'll go on to the next one and uh, and try to find a method for that and so on. And this is called inheritance. If you can pass from one class that the uh, function doesn't know to another class that it does know, and it still works. Um, let's see what I did next. Ah. Uh, OK. 
Okay. What was this about? A class can be an ordered, can be a character vector. All right. So there can be um, there can be more than one one class. We see here that X, which I guess we created earlier, has both ordered and factor as a class. Sys time gives POSIX CT and POSIX T uh, as attributes, as class attributes. Um, and so basically, here we see the different methods possible given an object and a generic function. And what happens here with our X, which was ordered and a factor, um, when we pass it to print and look closely at it with this S3 dispatch function, we see that it skips print.ordered and chooses print.factor uh, for the method. Um, for sysTime, similarly, it has some methods available, but it chooses POSIX CT, the first one, because it has a method available for that, for that class. Method can delegate work by calling next method. Okay, didn't really know what was going on with next method. Um, so we can look at that more closely shortly if everyone would like. Basically the idea here of, uh, of this set of classes, if an object has more than one class, is that the classes that come earliest uh, in that list, like uh, ordered here comes earlier than factor um, are called uh, are called subclasses of the of the subsequent um, classes, and following classes are superclasses of the preceding ones. Um, and so this is just. Uh, an idea and probably a good idea to have if you have more than one class per object. But just so you know, um, you don't necessarily have to have to order uh, your class attributes in any particular way. Ah, now we get to next method, and I've um, done all the work for you here. Uh, it's the hardest part of inheritance to understand, and I suppose I found that hard to understand. Sorry. And that concludes my presentation. I know I left some stuff out at the end. I uh, had some uh, difficulty understanding it. So I, but let's see what we get, get to in the, in the discussion. Thanks, Chris. I thought you did a really good job going through the content. Um, Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, and I, I think it would be awesome to have a discussion. Um, I guess the, uh, the first thing that came to mind when you're talking about um, the method dis dispatch stuff is um, I feel like uh, when I work with date dates and date times a lot, um, like I'll do things where uh, like I'll convert, I'll like put them in a list or something, or I, I forget exactly what, but then uh, when I go to do something later to them in the data frame, they're numeric all of a sudden, you know? And like, um, and I always like kind of get confused because I'm like, in what step did this become numeric? And like, I have to convert it back. And I feel like there are certain, yeah, like certain method dispatches for different functions or if that even makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, like, uh, you know, and I feel like that, that always confuses me. Yeah. Yeah. Certain functions might not, um, you know, have the most specific method that you would want them to have, you know, and sort of maintain the, uh, like date time that you're expecting it to be. And then, um, since it goes, goes up that ordered list from subclass to superclass, if it chooses one of those, maybe it just changes it on back to an, to an integer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like and I guess that. that has something to do with, like, is it related, like, co co coercion? Hmm. Like, and 
the rules around coercion, um, which seems to be related to this discussion, but I'm not exactly sure how. Um, I'm yeah, assuming I'm, that the function you use, the output is going to be numeric, numeric because that's what's expecting to give, right? Like if you, mm -hmm. so it doesn't even know that it is a date time, it's just implying it's a date time, right? And, and that's um, because um, the base type of a date time is integer double, I think. Or maybe yeah. a date time is like a list with integers and doubles, but then it right. can be. Yeah. Um, so maybe, so like the, the function probably co coerces it or, or pulls the numeric uh, attribute from that date time object, right? Yeah, it probably converts it to whatever it needs it to be and then does it. Mm -hmm. So I think if you are running into this problem to debug it, you might use that S3 dispatch um, function and try that on different parts of your code to see what actually is happening. Because if it's not using the um, date time, right, then it, in, instead it's using um, numeric as the version, then that would be telling you that it's actually not using the method that you'd like. So maybe that function doesn't actually have a method for what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, yeah. I could share my screen for a second and talk through how I've been using uh, S3 lately, um, if that helps. Sure, thanks. Okay. Um, I think this one. All right, so I've been working on this package called Headliner and it, uh, it uses glue to like, create what I'm calling headlines. So these could be like titles of plots or sections of R markdowns. Um, there's a lot of cool functionality here, but it essentially just compares two, two values and then kind of creates all of these, uh, all of these like components about that difference. So like what's the percentage difference? What's the, all of that's happening in this compare values function. But like what's the percentage difference? Is it increase or decrease? Like it just kind of creates all these like talking points and then you string them together um, to something like this, like the trend of Delta. And then it like, puts, there's like a little original values thing and it like write that for you. Um, but uh, it works different. Like I wanna be able to pass it, um, like where I just say like compare 20 to 25. It's like compare, uh, compare 20 to 25, but sometimes I wanna like pass a list. So some of the functions in the headliner uh, allow you to compare objects, but what it spits out is a list. And so when the list happens, the logic's a little different. So like to find my compare and reference objects is a little, is like kind of a couple of different steps. So I think that the way that the use method works is it says, all right, headline is this thing that I'm going to use. Um, and when you see it, use like like use method means like go look for it's like these like S3 um, methods, I guess. So um, he so headline default is just this is the standard way that head headliner is going to work. Um, but anything that's not in the default, um, it's going to, sorry, I'm not explaining this well. Um, let's like start bottom up. So if, if it gets a list, so it's going to like hit this, see, see that it's used methods. So it's going to say, okay, there's methods associated with this. Then it's going to go look for the different methods. So really all I have is like headline.list versus headline.default. But I could have like headline I did have at one point dot data frame. And then it was like doing something different when it hits a data. So like the data frame manipulation was a little different before then piping it ultimately into um, so what I call headline here, that's the default headline. So the method part then comes into play. Like if you get a list there, apply this method. If you get yeah. a data frame, apply this other method. Okay. Yeah. I'm so excited about this package more than anything else. This I can drop the dot. I'm like super excited about this package. Amazing. Also. Uh, and I, I like how the hex sticker that I'm working on is, is coming along. Um, but I think, I think it's going to be a big game changer for a lot of data analysts. So I'm, I'm pretty Heck excited. Yeah. About it. Um, the, the hex sticker is the important part, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Of course, especially in this time of uh, the coronavirus where we're all um, in our homes, but uh, okay. So, so I call headline headline calls use method that says, go look for the methods depend like based on the class of the object. It sees that I have a list. It goes down here, does some of this work. Then it passes it on to the default 
like whatever my headline that default is. So then it like passes it up there. And then that's actually the result that I will get. And then I think what next method is doing is if you have like a subclass. Um, so, so if I had, I think if I had headline dot, I'm not sure I like fully got it, but I think if I had headline dot, uh, what was it ordered? Like it would do some stuff and then in it, I could call next method if something needed to happen. And then it would call headline dot factor is what I think it will do. I, 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 that's kind of what I was maybe putting together, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. So is um, that like conceptually setting up the hierarchy where it will look for different order, different levels of a class if it doesn't find I, I think so. Well? Okay. Yeah, so, so, I, so yeah, I might have a headline factor class that has a certain manipulation, but like to get there, I might need, um, if it's ordered, I might need to like unorder it or put it in a different order, or who knows what. And so like, I might do that and then, and then I think I call next method to then pass it to factor and then factor will do what it needs. And then that will then call headline, like that will call headline to just um, call the default method. And then so what happens in the documentation, uh, headliner, so when I, when I like namespace it, all that comes back is headline. Um, and if I don't recall, like, but if I did like a third, you can see that there's like more methods in there. Oh. But there's a, a data frame, a default and a list. So it's also, I don't know. I've like seen this before with like um, like sequence. I'll see sequ like all these different sequence options. So those are all like so that's what's happening. Yeah, you look at a function and I'll say use method in the body. And I'm like, oh, that's not informative. So that's oh, what fun. I learned. I learned mm -hmm. how to do that. Um, so yeah, you you do that, and then I think uh, uh, methods list. Methods list, methods list. There is a way that you can get into uh, like what the methods are, but it's not uh, as straightforward as I think most people want. Cause yeah, you could, you could do, uh, uh, you could use the sequence and then it just says use method underneath. So if you're like, well, what does it do? It's a little hard. Um, I think there was some sloop function that they mentioned in the chapter that does that, but I don't remember what it was. Yeah, I didn't, I don't think I have sleep. Yeah, there was a lot of it. random, uh, a lot of different things and I couldn't keep track of all of them. So Jake, the, the dots, yeah. oh. back, like headline dot list, um, <laughs> that, so, sorry, I haven't done a lot of work with this. Does, does R recognize that as a, as a method for headline? Yeah. Okay. So I feel like I've seen- So if I wanted it to, add, if I wanted my function to be head, headline.list, um, I couldn't, I don't think I could, uh, I, I don't think you could do that because it, because it's in a S3, because it's in a method like this, it's like, it's gonna interpret that as a list. Um, and you should be using snake case these days anyways, but I'm um, just being a- uh, uh, Yeah. And ask, but um, because you can construct like right because you can construct like variable names and stuff like that with with like in that in that way too right like even if you're not working with s3 classes or whatever um like it's valid to just say like i don't know uh uh or or is it always going to refer to a method like no I, I, you're saying like if if I just create a function that had something something dot list. Would it yeah. try to call a method? I don't. I don't think so. Not not unless you have. Oh, oh. Not unless you have this guy up top, or not up top. I don't think it has to be at the top of your script, but you need to have um, something that says this. That, that so that kind of kicks off. Name. That kicks off that you're now programming in a S three. Yeah. Okay. And then maybe this is obvious, but the, sorry if this is a stupid question, but the, no. then it'll go down to the right method in method dispatch based on the type of the input. Like how yeah. does it know? 
Okay. So if it's a list, it'll go to headline.list. If it's a, like, if you're comparing reference or lists, mm -hmm. it'll go to headline.list. Okay. And like, it just does that behind the scenes. Like, is that what the magic, the dark magic of, uh, of method dispatches? Like, well, wouldn't you have to define what class the method's for somewhere? Um, well, I think you have to define the class if it's not one of those, like, like I don't know if it was base class. You need or, like a or not. But it, like, if you wanted to define your own class, then uh, you'd have to have some somewhere in your code that you're defining your own class of the objects. So I think I think you could say like um, I don't know like my I don't know it would be that. But it would it would say like head. No, let's see. Uh, I don't know. Cool or make plot. So maybe headliner has something that's make plot that plays nicely with headliner. And then in here, I would do something where I would use that attributes of the GG plot that I'm probably going to pass it. And I would give it a, a class of like a headline plot or something. And then there'd be more around here that'd be like, I think it'd, it'd be inside a function. Um, and then I think, and then I, and then I could create a headline dot make plot or no headline dot headline plot right because this is the class so there's a relationship between these and so if if that happens then it's going to is that now a subclass um i think it's its what? own class unless i i think i think if you did um Something like that, it would have. Uh -huh. This is the subclass, and that's the superclass. Wait, uh, Jake. Yeah. What, so just to clarify, because I think I, I get this. So what's going on now, like before adding this stuff, you aren't you aren't creating a headline class as of yet. You're no. creating a headline generic that's going to do stuff with other existing classes, right? Yeah, if I'm working with existing classes, yeah. I don't need to do any anything where I'm defining a class. Right. Okay. Okay. So it's like you, that's why all your functions are like headline dot name of existing class because you're saying I made this generic and it's gonna you know take objects of other classes and figure out what to do with them basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. That was a helpful clarification. That helped me out a lot. Cool. Cool. What what other questions came up? So my big breakthrough of this chapter was figuring out how to read the S3 dispatch function output. Um, I don't know if other people struggle with this, but I like looked at it for so long and was so confused. And then like, finally, I think understood it better. Um, but hey, let me share my screen really quick, just so I can, cause I also want to confirm that I got this right. Cause I was really confused about it. If people don't mind. Yeah. Uh, okay, so can you see the book? Yeah. Okay. So please someone jump in and like shout out that I'm, I'm confused. But what really confused me about looking at these S3 dispatch things at first is that I would like see this list and I would be like, wait a second, if print.ordered is there, like why did it skip it? Like how did it know to get to print.factor? Like why is the arrow there? And what eventually occurred to me that I think is right is that the, the output here, like this list is not a list of methods that actually exist. It's just a, it's just a list of method names that it's trying to hit in its dispatch. So what's occurring here is that it says, okay, 
the class is ordered and the generic is print. So the first thing I'm going to do is look for a print dot ordered. But this doesn't actually like this method is doesn't exist. It's in the output because it looked for it, but it's not, it didn't exist. So it skipped to the next one, which was print dot factor, which did exist. So it gets an arrow. And then it is also telling us, by the way, print dot default also existed, but it didn't get used. So it gets a star. And then like this one, it's looking for like bracket dot ordered, but order that, that doesn't exist. And then it's looking for bracket dot factor, which did exist, so it used it. And then it looked for bracket dot default, but that didn't exist. Um, so, it, but there was a, a next method in here, a next method call. So it went to this internal one. So like, what I think made me understand is that like the things that get symbols next to the ones next to them in here are the methods that actually exist. And if there's no symbol next to it, it means like it looked for that method, but it didn't exist. So I was like staring at these lists being like, why is it skipping them? Why is it skipping them? But it's skipping them, I believe, because it doesn't exist. And I kind of figured that out by using the, um, the sloop get method functions that returns that data frame that tells you what all the methods are. So like if you do sloop get method for the bracket function, then it'll give you a list and it won't include things like bracket.order or bracket.default. Um, so that made me think that I was understanding it right after staring at it for a while. But I don't know if anyone else got tripped up on that because that caused me a lot of grief reading this chapter. And like, yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> No, that's great. That was, that was my my understanding that it um, because your attributes for X are ordered and factor, it it tries print dot ordered um, that doesn't find it. It goes to print dot factor, which it does find. So it gets the arrow. What else? What I really don't get is the stuff coming up, like the, the R6 and those kind of things. Um, that might be well, tricky. The, the chapter says S3 should be like, a good go-to, so we might get away with not understanding the next few chapters, but uh, I bet they'll be interesting. So I'm presenting next week, so hopefully I do a okay job. I've already seen in the chapter, there's a bunch of questions for R6, like in the exercises where the question is something like, why couldn't you do this in S3? And like my goal uh -oh. is to be able to answer one of those for us. But if you see those and like think of this week and like think of an answer, then like stash it away. And we'll, if I don't get it, we'll at least have like hit one as a group. Cause those seem like pretty daunting, but I feel like if we can answer one of those, we'll definitely have understood something legit, so. That's what I'm, I'm putting up as my goal is to try to, try to get one of those without looking up the answer. Cool. Where is it? Sorry, at the beginning of the chapter. I, it's like they're like they're like peppered throughout the exercises. Like if you look through the R six wow. chapter, mm -hmm. um, there's like different exercise questions that are like, here's an example. Why couldn't uh, why yeah. couldn't you do that? like why can you do this in in R six but it wow. wouldn't work for S three? Yeah, I'm just looking at 
why can't you model a bank account or deck of cards with an S3 class? Yeah, those, those questions. And I'm like, great question. I wish I could answer that for you. But hopefully I'll be able to <laughs> next week. And maybe if I can't, one of you will be able to. <laughs> yeah, I think I need to take a deeper dive on this S3 chapter and try to create some classes and see where I go. Yeah. Yeah, actually Jake's code really um yeah clarified some of those ideas for me. Uh I really wanted to build a little toy S3 system, but you know, couldn't quite put all the pieces together. I think I have a better idea now. I mean, that's like six hours on a Saturday afternoon. Like, I, it took me forever to figure out what the heck it was. And then to get it to, like, print out the nice documentation, I, I like, did something wrong. And it, like, wasn't, it wasn't printing out correctly when I was trying to do, like, the package down to, to render the, the site with all the documentation. So, yeah, definitely, definitely a lot of confusion on that one. But it's starting to come together for me. Yeah, it looks good. It seems like you work on a lot of packages. Uh, yeah, I have. How do you, how do you find the inspiration for these? You just like, that, are you like solving problems for yourself and turning them into packages, or like? Yeah, a lot of stuff comes up at work, where yeah. there's something that would be a lot easier if if we had a package, but we don't, and so and then I don't have like dedicated time at work to work on those things, so I just uh, do it in my in my free time. But I think almost all of them come from work ideas. Mm -hmm. I'll take the chapter on expressions. Um, oh yeah. Uh, okay. So is that the the one after next week? No, I think it's a couple a couple away. It's just oh, one. That, um, right. Been, so next week is uh, R six. Ezra, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then there's like S4 after that. And then there's a chapter called Trade Offs, which good luck to you if you are going to do trade offs. <laughs> I don't know how long it is. Is, uh, all right. Well, is anyone interested in taking S4? The S4 chapter? I'm about after? due. I haven't presented in a while. I'll do S4. Okay. Did we lose? We lost. Uh, what was her name? Abby. Abby. I haven't seen her in a while. Yeah. She was here when me, her, and someone else logged in accidentally, and that week we skipped. Um. Uh -oh. So she was there like two weeks ago, and we, when no one else was here for like the five minutes till we realized that we were skipping the session. So she's. You guys like, showed up. Just has so she showed up to the one that we didn't get to, and you know, uh, so she's lurking somewhere. Awesome. Nice, uh... All right, Great. we'll make Eric, which will come back. Eric, you might be able to do uh trade offs too because it's actually like very short when I look at it. Mm. So, it's four and trade offs, yeah, it's like three sections, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we could do that more of as a discussion anyway. Um, you know, I don't think that that's going to be that more than informative differences, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. And while we're at it, does anyone want to do the big picture chapter uh, of metaprogramming right before expressions? We could also talk about that next week. Uh, I'll check my schedule, but I think I could do it if uh, okay. I'll have to make sure I'm, I'm traveling to Canada. I just got to make sure it's not the week I'm doing that. Okay. Wow, that's already into December. Wow, December 3rd. It's flying by. All right. Cool. All right. Well, maybe we'll just check in on that next week. Um, I feel like one of my goals is going to like to be to try to create some S3 code, like, class, like classes, and then put it into the chat and see if it makes sense. Uh, like, try to like Chris, you were saying, like, uh, 
do a toy example or something. Like over the weekend. So, try to do that. One of my goals is to uh, use headliner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I want some feedback. Um, see if Was that, uh, did you post that in the uh, wins and feedback? Or I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. No, I didn't see it in there. Wish I would have. This thing's great. I'll check it out. I was hoping the heck sticker would come through as like the little, you know, the little snippet that it shows you, but uh, it just showed you a, a dumb paragraph. But... There's a sticker in there. The heck oh, there's a... I don't think in Slack though. Oh, in Slack, no, yeah. Like the little preview, it's yeah. it's kind of uninspiring. Um, oh, it's like newspapers. That's uh, yeah, the it's like a newspaper. Yeah, That's I want to see all the the approaches you use to extracting those insights or whatever you call them. I call them insights, but um, yeah, yeah, no, that's what I would call it too. It's mostly like to give context to the numbers you're trying to report. So you say like, you know, the, um, you know, our current, our current uh, sales number is X. Well, is X meaningful or not? And then like how much code is required to answer that question, I think is, is pretty, uh, I think it's, it could be a lot of code. I, I think, it, you know, depending on how well you want to construct that sentence, it could be like a couple hundred lines of code. Uh, so Headliner does stuff like, builds articles for you. So if you want like an increase versus a decrease, like it will like figure that out for you or an 800% versus a 100%, um, like it will figure those articles out as well. So it like kind of helps you like put these sentences together in a like readable way. Um, Beautiful. And if you haven't used glue, uh, glue is super, super cool and kind of underpins the whole thing. But. Yeah, I've used glue. I usually use str underscore glue instead of like the main. What does that one do? I don't know. <laughs> it, just, it gives you the same functionality as using glue. So I don't know if you guys know what the difference is, but yeah, you just literally, you put curly braces around your um, parameters and it goes and references the object value and fits it in with all your text, just like glue would, I think. So I don't know. Yeah I, yeah, I found glue like recently and I started using uh, glue. It was a glue data frame or from data frame. Glue, glue data? Uh, or glue data, yeah, yeah. 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 That's really helpful. Um, I've used it a bunch to like construct. Well, actually, I don't think you're supposed to do this because of SQL injections, but construct like parameterized SQL. But, like, so instead of like writing out, like there's a bunch of the same variable, but like that has like a different number at the end of it or something in a table, uh, like constructing a query that way. Um, but I think glue actually has a SQL method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Do you guys know, could, do the SQL code chunks only work in notebooks? Because I've only seen them work when I'm using a notebook. You only get the play button in a notebook. Okay. This is what I've yeah. had. Um, what I, what I do is I just, uh, use DB get query, uh, and I just put it in a string, the query in a yeah, string. I yeah. If I, yeah. When I, when I needed it to like PDF or, or whatever, I, I do yeah. DB. but yeah, sometimes I'm of... playing around with the SQL code in the code chunk, but I've only seen it work in notebooks. I didn't know if that was me or if it was the notebook. Yeah. I think, I think that's true. Like I found it really annoying that like people who like didn't use R, uh, if I wanted to share that SQL query with them, there's all those like quotes around the variable names that you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and like, it was like really kind of annoying to, to like, you could just find and replace, but it's just like, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's not the same style as like, if you were to use like Microsoft server SQL or SQL or whatever, like the program is that people use to outside of R and Python. Um, I don't know. It was. I just found that kind of frustrating. But at work, we've, um, I think, for the most part, started to like separate the SQL functionality from the 
the dashboard functionality that we're building. So um, we, well, usually we make like a, a data mart that we just like select star from. So it's like almost no code at all. Um, but if you have like a proof of concept that requires a significant SQL query, uh, we'll just like make a SQL file in the same folder and then just uh, like use read lines or read file or something to bring that in and then like have get, get DB query uh, read that. Rather than putting all the code in the uh, putting all the code in the in the R document, because yeah, like if you need to make some changes, like it's not going to give you any errors about your, you know, like you spelled from or wrong or something. Like it won't give you any feedback around like mistakes in your SQL code. So mm -hmm. it's like nice to like write the SQL code in another program and then just read the lines. To bring yourself. Cool. All right. Um, well, I think that's probably it for us tonight. Does anyone have anything else? All right. Well, thank, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, I definitely need to go back and read this a little more carefully. I realized that I didn't understand as much as I thought. Um, uh, so, but thank you for, for doing a good job on the presentation. Well, same. And it uh, helped me understand some stuff just to present yeah. it and have, have some discussion. So thanks everybody. Yeah, I enjoyed the humor. It cracked me up a few times, man. It was really good. Yeah, I, was laughing okay. too. <laughs> I tried. Dark, <laughs> dark magic of method dispatch. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Oh, it says that in the book. I just stole it right from him. Yeah. No, we were giving you credit. <laughs> I should have taken it. <laughs> if you, I think if you do question mark internal, R will say that it's only for wizards. Like that helped. I don't know how I got there. It not that ended up not being something I, I was supposed to be looking at, but it, it just says like this is only for wizards or something. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, dark magic. Did you wait the question mark internal? I think so. I can... All right, I'll play with that later. <laughs> I can't quite figure that out. Right now. Uh, I'll, I'll find it and put it in the chat. Um, okay. Right. Yeah, because I'm not seeing it there. But cool. All right. So we all have a, have a good evening. Uh, dot, it's dot internal. Oh, dot internal. Dot internal. All right. Everyone find a weird error message for next week. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night everyone. everyone.